guys, it's Bunny and welcome to today's video and welcome to another WWE reaction. This video was recommended by Dancing Pig and he said if you are interested in WWE versus WCW, okay, I'm sorry the name. I'm just imagining a dancing pig right now. Boo -boo. I highly recommend watching Implement's video. There will never ever be another show like Monday Night Raw. This is one of the best videos explaining the Attitude Era. Oh my god, I guess this is our favorite era, even though it's the most painful for me to react to and watch you guys. I think it is the highest entertaining era in wrestling and i wish there is something close to it back but i guess it ain't happening in this asian time but this video is by m plemon and he said there will be that i mean the title is there will never ever be another show like monday night Raw. so let's go and watch it. in the first episode of never ever i talked about the appeal of spongebob I like Spongebob, and it's not difficult to explain why I like Spongebob, because everybody likes Spongebob. Professional wrestling is a bit of a different story. Oh, it's connected. When I say names like Ric Flair, Randy Savage, Hulk Hogan, and Woo! Andre the Giant, Woo! most of you can probably picture a vague figure in your heads, Exactly. you can't specifically tell who I'm talking about. Why is this? Unless you're talking to me now and not to me six months ago now i know a thing or two hell yeah <laughs> well the answer is professional wrestling is one of the most popular and unpopular forms of entertainment on earth everybody knows about wwe yeah watching professional wrestling is like trying to justify why manatees haven't gone extinct on the surface, it just looks so dumb and awkward and makes you wonder how something like it could even Poor exist. Poor eyesight, no natural predator. how it continues to exist. Now, I'll admit, the idea of watching half-naked, oily, buff dudes pretending to beat each other up doesn't exactly sound like the most entertaining thing in the world. But that's kind of what makes it so amazing. Yeah. Because despite its, it's weird, weird premise and clumsy I don't know how to explain professional it. Wrestling like if 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 there is a person who is not a fan, like listen, when I got into into wrestling, like literally this year, it's fresh as F. I people were asking me what you've been doing, what's with your YouTube? Like it changed, like my friends and family members and so and I start explaining to them, hey, oh yeah, about that. WWE be like, and I'm like, and they're like, oh, wait, really? You're into that? And I'm like, yeah, you have no idea. It's actually really entertaining. Listen to me. And yeah, I don't think any of them started watching WWE because of me. But like still, it, 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 I don't know how to explain it to people. I, I don't know how I got into it, but I did. Because it's so difficult to explain the in like yeah how it's not like fake you know how it is actually plausible how it is very entertaining how it's like a reality show but even better you know like i don't know how to explain it to people fosters the capacity uh, it, for it, it emotional just, it just is that can it's just an entertaining arena of stoic adults to <laughs> jump out of their seats and scream like little kids yeah especially oh, live yeah. watching this look exactly don't believe me well, then you probably haven't watched an episode of Monday Night Raw. I mean, I haven't watched an episode, but I have watched some clips. What's but amp, a lot of you are probably thinking, professional wrestling isn't real. This is you must be too what they tell dumb me. to realize that. I am smarter than you because I know that professional wrestling is fake. Uh oh my god, this is exactly what they say. But you know it's not real, right? You know, like, they, 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 it's not real. I'm like, oh my god. No, I don't see what you see there. I don't see the fake punches they make sometimes. Like, no, I don't see that. I think it's completely 100% real, everything. <sighs> and then they watch reality shows. Listen to me. Then they watch reality shows and they believe in reality. Because it's called reality show, they think it's a real thing. It's not all scripted and written down and, uh, and staged. No, 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 it's reality show, okay? Oh, man, you got me. <laughs> Professional wrestling is not, in fact, a real athletic competition. 
There's no getting around that. Guess I have to end the video here because pro wrestling isn't real. <laughs> it's still real to me, damn it! Yeah, man! <laughs> Leave me alone! But neither is Star Wars, or the Avengers, exactly. or Goku, or Homer Simpson, oh, but or you... any character in Super Smash Bros. Yep. None of these things are real. However, it doesn't stop people from talking about them far more than they do a lot Harry of real things. Exactly. And in order to truly appreciate the rhetorical and get into value it. of pro wrestling, you must treat it as it really is, a work of fiction. Exactly. But not just any fiction. Pro wrestling is one of the last remaining bastions of theater. Now, mm. like a lot of you, I went to public school where many of you can probably remember multiple times in English class when school you had to learn prison. about this guy <laughs> called Bill Shakespeare. Considered by Bill many scholars Williams. to be the greatest playwright of all time. Yeah. And for so many years, I didn't get the appeal. I don't think anyone else did either. The only types of people in school who actually seemed to care about Shakespeare were the future MIT grad who memorized every piece of trivia ever. I mean, ever, to be honest, I had to care about Shakespeare because I had a Shakespearean for a whole semester in my university. And I had to read all the sonnets and all the plays in English. Old English, by the way. Yeah, I mean, I'm not complaining, really. It was fun. It, it, I can say that I have done that in my life. Kid who was way too it's into huge of a book, you guys. I never realized the value of Shakespeare until I discovered the treasure trove of old pro wrestling clips on YouTube. And after we pay Jack Fluga in the time, we want the gold sucker. Hulk Hogan, we coming for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is epic. <laughs> and only then did I realize why people other. love Shakespeare. Reading Shakespeare in seventh grade English is so boring because the content is not meant to be consumed this through is what words I read. on paper. Oh, Shakespearean plays flourished during a time before the majority of people knew how to read. Playwrights and actors had to craft compelling narrative performances using the limited tools they had. If you boil it down, the genre of theater mostly involves a bunch of weird people in stupid costumes <laughs> prancing around and over embellishing in iambic pentameter. Theatrical entertainment doesn't come from what's literally happening on stage. The value of theater comes from filling in the blanks using our imagination. This fundamental principle is otherwise known as the suspension of disbelief. It's why when you see this image, your brain doesn't automatically interpret it as some guy called Mark Hamill holding a blue no, stick. When no. you see this image, it's a Jedi. you see Luke Skywalker, Luke Skywalker holding a lightsaber. Yeah. Neither of which are actually real. Suspension of disbelief oh allows my God, us to accept that? beyond what's literally happening on screen. It allows us to experience a story and its characters as real, no matter how simple the True. presentation. See, this like I literally just left. Oh, who who actually searched is Luke real? The, uh, the this literally ex explains it. Like some people get into it so much. Principle applies to novels, that for him it's comic normal books, to that. musical lyrics, cartoons, movies. And yes, professional wrestling. Visual storytelling is an inherently human art form. And people have been performing stories for audiences you still have for the, thousands of years, opera, the dating old all the way back to the, the earliest way? known auditoriums of ancient Greece, where citizens that. would gather around and listen to an esteemed orator recite the works of Homer. I'm so angry I could spit flames out of my butt! Homer, Homer Simpson, Simpson versus, versus Lisa, Lisa Simpson. Simpson. Oh my god. It should go without saying that. Oh, the... so this is like the Kenny Omega fighting or wrestling a nine year old. Okay, now I get 1990s it. 1990s in America were very different from 6th century BC Greece. 3,000 years ago, people really didn't have that much stuff to drown out the entertainment value of a guy standing on a platform Books and just talking like a to the audience. The 1990s was the birth of a new era of screens. Television, video games, huge blockbuster Seinfeld movies, is still even like the beginning one of the World Wide the world. Web. The new millennium was rapidly approaching, and everyone mm. was preparing for the futuristic, technocratic, utopian future of the 2000s by surrounding themselves with the newest, coolest gadgets of the age. Yeah. You'd expect that all these new <laughs> entertainment sources wouldn't Nine, leave much room for a little old for theater. And you'd probably be right if it weren't for professional wrestling. From about 1996 to 2001, Professional wrestling became one of the most inescapable cornerstones of American entertainment. And in order to Every understand why, we must first talk about a guy by the name of Vince McMahon. In order to be loved. 
You must build an、uh, empire. Vince McMahon started out with nothing. Why you he was trapped in a dirt、military. poor household with an abusive stepfather. Today he's worth about three point five billion dollars, which is a little bit more than Donald Trump. It should be noted that、more? this disparity hasn't prevented the two from being friends, which is the primary reason why Vince's wife Linda is currently in the executive cabinet of the United States. Perhaps Vince and Donald、oh. are such good friends because they have so much in common. The two billionaires were born just ten months apart. Both got rich not through a groundbreaking invention, but through ruthless business acumen. Both of them started a rival football Dude, league to the NFL the that ultimately failed,、ever. and both of them built empires by transforming businesses that they inherited from their fathers. In Vince McMahon's case, he reunited with his father, Vince McMahon Sr., at the age of 12. Vince Sr. owned the World Wide、right, Wrestling Federation, and Vince took a managerial、it. position at the company. Perhaps the most phenomenal athlete of all time, standing to my right, the one and only Andre the Giant, heads up one on one. By the mid 1980s, Vince Sr. had passed away, and Vince McMahon was now in charge of a booming wrestling empire. He actually had to buy the company from his father. With Over his the own past、money. decade, McMahon had completely overhauled the territorial system of the pro wrestling industry and transformed the WWF into a nationally recognized brand. In the 80s, the WWF experienced their first great boom period. Vince's ambitious business ventures, like WrestleMania, brought professional wrestling into the American pay-per-view market. And transformed stars like Hulk Hogan into national icons. My brother had、w、Hulk Hogan and stuff like that back in the day. He was into wrestling, and he had these like really old magazines with oily buffed guys. <laughs> and I was a child when I found those. I was like, okay, kind of scary these guys like, but like balloons, you know, like. <laughs> But he was into、WF's、it for like one year. Maybe. The WWF's huge success <laughs> in the late '80s quickly began to recede in the early '90s. However, this was due to a multitude of reasons, ranging from a waning audience, Hulk Hogan departing for Hollywood,、yeah. and a massive steroid controversy that almost、oh, sent、yeah. Vince to prison. Coupled with other failed experiments such as the、Kinda、World Bodybuilding here,、huh? Federation, it's safe to say that by 1993, Vince was in dire need of a new enterprise. It was at this time、oh, yeah, when Vince decided、really、to transition the、Austin、WWF into a staple of cable television through the debut of、opinion. Monday Night Raw. Ever since the popularization of the television in American society, professional wrestling has always had its place on TV. But never to the extent of what Monday Night Raw sought to accomplish. Prior to Raw, the primary role of wrestling on TV was to stimulate interest for live shows or pay-per-views. Wrestling programming at this time was supplemental and mostly involved recapping old events or promoting new ones. You would hardly ever see any high-profile or interesting wrestling matches televised during this time, as the、mm. intrigue was reserved for more important events. Monday Night Raw changed all of that by broadcasting new matches and progressing the story every Monday night on the USA Network. Before Raw, pro wrestling was limited in its storytelling capabilities, as most of the time the audience would only be aware of the narrative and characters through a handful of pay-per-view events each year.、Mm. Raw greatly expanded the capacity for storytelling、oh, yeah. in the WWF,、Definitely. as the audience could now、every、tune、week. into new developments on a weekly、yeah. basis. The foundation had been set、more. for one of the most、we、innovative and unique、NXT. television programs in the world, but it would take an entirely separate force to truly take Raw to the next level. Today, the WWF is now the WWE, and it's the only major wrestling promotion in America. In the 90s, however, there was another. WCW、yeah. was a wrestling promotion largely based in、and、the South. And they were、South. like. And by the 1990s, it was the only major wrestling promotion in America that Vince had failed to conquer. The company was largely helped by the endorsement of media mogul Ted Turner, a longtime wrestling fan who supported WCW by airing its programming on the Turner family of networks. In the early 90s, WCW quickly became a popular alternative to the WWF, due in large part to signing some of the WWF's older and more established talent. 
In 1995, a Turner Network executive by the name of Eric Bischoff decided the time was right to challenge the WWF's throne as the number one wrestling company in America. On September 4th, 1995, WCW would launch Monday Nitro, their own weekly block of wrestling entertainment on TNT. Nitro would go on to compete head-to-head -head with Raw, occupying the same primetime time slot. And starting in 1996, How smart Nitro this? would overtake Raw in television Aww. viewership, beginning an 84-week long streak of WCW dominance. In the midst of Nitro's prolonged period of success over Raw, Vince McMahon knew that his company was now in jeopardy. More and more mm. of the WWF's high-end talent were jumping ship to WCW, leaving Raw stuck with a cast of unpopular and unproven faces. Mm. So when faced with such stiff competition, Vince did what any other monarch would do when his empire is threatened. Go to war. You want to go to war? You want a war? You're going to get one. It has been said that anything can happen here in the World Wrestling Federation, but now more than ever, truer words have never been spoken. <gasps> oh. Hey, we want to see the war! <laughs> Just kidding, we don't want wars. You don't I, see knives, you. you don't see guns, uh, you don't see rapes, you don't see anything at all like that that's portrayed in anything that we do. Yeah. It's a very wholesome, family-oriented environment. WWF wrestling in the 80s and early 90s was largely a reflection of American culture at the time. It had a deceptively sanitized exterior of traditional family values that was masking a grotesque underbelly of steroids, True. cocaine, and painkillers. You had the bleached blonde hero Hulk Hogan patriotically leg-dropping America's nefarious foreign adversaries. By the mid-90s, a lot of people in America began to see through the facade which gave rise to a huge movement of counterculture. Oh. oh yeah. All of a sudden, you had the American hero Hulk Hogan dyeing his beard black, smoking cigars, and beating up good guys on WCW, and people loved it. Vince could see the tide of American culture turning, mm. and he knew that if he wanted to save his empire, he was Time going to, to have go. to get edgy. Yep, what transpired was edgy. one of the most awe-inspiring two years in the history of American television. With Monday Night Raw and WCW Nitro constantly like trying to outdo it. each other for a share of the American TV audience. Steve is a dead man walking because when Austin 316 meets Pillman, oh my God. Not a yeah. Were Imagine guys? if Seinfeld and Friends were both <laughs> trying to put each other out of business as members of each cast would constantly swap back and forth between each show. This is what it must have been like to watch professional wrestling during this era. I could list off a compilation of all the outrageous to show you one moment from one episode of Monday Night Raw. Steve Austin but before you can truly know the significance of this moment, I've got some explaining to do. First and foremost, Every good story needs a good protagonist. So mm -hmm. let's talk about Mick Foley. In order to be loved, defy all expectations. When you picture a professional wrestler in your head, you probably don't picture a guy like Mick Foley. Mick Foley's pear-shaped physique hardly yeah. resembles the tall, chiseled yeah. muscle men that are common in the WWF. Mick Foley doesn't have the freakish size, Herculean strength, or Olympic athleticism to draw an audience. Yep. The reason wrestling fans watch Mick Foley is to watch him get hurt. By all yep. measures, Mick Foley is simply not talented enough to earn a share of the pro wrestling spotlight. To compensate for this, he sacrifices his own body through some of the most death-defying stunts the WWF has ever seen. Oh Perhaps my god, the risky hangman stunt. Unfortunately, the ring ropes have been drawn extra taut, cutting off his means of escape and placing him at serious risk of asphyxiation. Foley is forced to wedge his head through the rope to free himself. Mick Foley's most iconic moment came in 1998 during the second ever Hell in a Cell match. Jeez. In this match, Mick Foley is wrestling as Mankind. Just one of his three different wrestling personas. Dude Mankind is supposed Jack. to be this disfigured, gremlin-like guy who lives in the boiler room beneath the arena. He finishes off his opponents by suffocating them with a dirty sock. Ew, and he's completely Mr. insane. Soko. 
In this match, oh, mankind yeah, with the Undertaker is fighting when he... the Ooh. Undertaker. The Undertaker is one of the most legendary Do and recognizable wrestlers of all time. It's difficult to get wrestling fans to agree on anything, but even the most jaded ones will act giddy upon hearing the sound of The Undertaker's iconic dong. Oh yeah. Oh my god! What? The it's crazy. Has risen! The popularity of The Undertaker is difficult to describe for anyone who's not a fan of professional wrestling. And I'm not going to try to explain it now, but maybe Justin Wang from the YouTube channel Wang can, since, you know, he kind of looks like The Undertaker. Nah. The Undertaker is hands down the greatest character in the history of WWE. He debuts at a time when Vince is going crazy throwing all kinds of different gimmicks against the wall. Literally shares yep. his first pay-per-view appearance with a guy in a giant turkey costume. But unlike the garbage man who for some reason also wrestles, or the plumber who for some reason also wrestles, the undead zombie who for some reason also wrestles had way more staying power. The Undertaker very quickly becomes a fan favorite and maintains that status for almost 30 years. Yep. He continually reinvents himself over the course of those 30 years and eventually becomes the unbeatable final boss of WrestleMania. Yeah. Except for that time he got beaten. But it's actually I kind of a good a thing that he got beaten now. because to pigeonhole him as the WrestleMania guy minimizes everything else that he's accomplished in his career. Thanks, Justin. I'm not going to get too much into The Undertaker right now because he doesn't really play a role in the Raw moment I'm discussing. Okay. But he was involved in Mick Foley's most recognizable moment ever by throwing mankind yeah. off the top of the cell in front of thousands of stunned spectators. <laughs> Mick Foley's 280-pound body plummeted from the height of a two-story building and splashed down on the announcer table below. No one had ever seen anything like oh it. Oh my god. The following shots of Mick Foley show medical personnel surrounding him and lifting his limp body onto a stretcher. At this point, any fan watching would have walked away completely satisfied with the oh, effort yeah. that Mick had already put into this one stunt. About five minutes later, this happened. Are you kidding me? He's back. He wants to go He back. wants more. Uh -uh. Like he already gave so much. If he throws him up on the other side, there's... Shortly after this, Mick Foley can be seen, somehow still conscious, How? sitting up in the ring corner with his tooth in his nostril. Ew. He then wrestled The Undertaker for about 10 more minutes, where he eventually got choke slammed onto a pile of thumbtacks. Yeah, this match was crazy, you guys. This match is insane. The Undertaker won this match, but Mick Foley, through his superhuman resilience to pain, had won the hearts of the WWF fans. Naturally, this match instantly cemented Mick Foley as a legend in the pro wrestling universe oh. and as a fan favorite. And even though he won the admiration of the audience, he never quite seemed like a guy who was supposed to win a lot of matches. And most importantly, never did anyone truly believe that Mick Foley could become the WWF champion. Did he? Gotta be the champion. So what's the point okay. of watching big, strong dudes throw each other off the tops of buildings? Well, the goal of both fictional wrestling and legitimate athletic competitions is to find out who is the best in the world. So you have a bunch of wrestlers fight each other, and some of them win more than others. And only then do the winningest wrestlers have an opportunity to fight for the WWF Championship. Yep, that's how Becoming the champion is not just the ultimate goal for the characters in the storyline. It is also the ultimate sign of validation for a wrestler's real life career. The fundamental foundation of every wrestling narrative is watching guys fight to become the champion. Lower tiers of wrestlers will each fight for their own version of a championship, but no title is more yeah. coveted and more prestigious than the WWF Heavyweight Championship. Historically, the, the WWF version. title has been reserved for only the biggest, most popular attraction in the company. When you become the WWF Champion, you become the face of the company. Usually, the championship only changes hands once, 
maybe twice a year. So whenever okay. it happens, it's a pretty big deal. And on the January 4th, 1999 episode of Raw, Mankind found himself with an opportunity to win the WWF Championship. Did he? This is the essence of his hero's journey. But every hero needs a good villain. And the villain of this story just so happens to be the guy Mick Foley is facing for the championship. A man who many of you already know. Oh, Do you God. smell what The Rock is cooking? In order to be loved, you must first be hated. Today, oh, The Rock is one of the most recognized Hollywood actors mm. on the planet. Although really many people deep. would agree that he makes a much better celebrity than an actor. Most of The Rock's repertoire today involves acting in high-profile but ultimately forgettable action flicks. And I Moana. Mean, Jumanji was... The Rock's <laughs> wife... And Moana. <laughs> Jumanji and Moana, they were not forgettable. Widespread I love them. today may raise the question of how he got popular in the first place. You see, 20 years ago, he The Rock is. burst onto the pop culture scene as a wrestling god. To this day, no one wrestler has ever been able to hold the audience in the palm of his hand quite like The Rock could. But it wasn't always like that. In fact, when The Rock first debuted in the WWF, oh my God. <laughs> he was hated. The Rock Rocky didn't start sucks. off as the wise, cracking, smack-talking, one-liner, dropping legend that many of you know him as today. He was a bland, dopey-looking Samoan <laughs> called Rocky Maivia who would stand in the middle of the ring and smile like a goober. This was a character that may have worked 10 years prior, but not during the era of edgy 90s counterculture. Yeah. WWF fans hated Rocky with a passion, and they would shower him with relentless oh booze while chanting, God. Die Rocky Die. Eventually, it became clear that the only way for Rocky Maivia to stop getting pushed around by the crowd was to push back. And on one yep. fateful day, The Rock was bored. I got three words. Die, Rocky, die. That's the gratitude I get from you pieces of crap. Over the next oh. two years, The Rock would transform into one of the most smarmy villains in the company, becoming such a good heel that, ironically, the audience had no choice but to love him. Yep. In 1998, The Rock would align himself with Vince McMahon and the corporation nice. to win the WWF Struggles Championship, commencing his new reign as the corporate champion. In order to become the champion, mankind would have to go through not just The Rock, but the squad of goons in Vince McMahon's corporate stable. Mm. The deck seemed stacked against him. At least it was until he got a little help from Triple H. Yay. In order to be loved, take control of the game. Triple H may be one of the most interesting wrestlers of all time. Not for what he's done inside of the ring, but for what he's done outside of it. True. Triple H started off as just another oh no-name wrestler out. in the mid-90s. He is now one of the top executives in the WWE. Yep. Yep. His real-life rise to power within the company is most likely due to his marriage with Stephanie McMahon, Damn. Vince McMahon's daughter and heir to the WWE throne. Not I would China. go more into Triple H, but this China. video by screenwriter Max Landis explains his career better than I ever could. I watched All you need to know for our story yeah. is that Triple H is the leader of a faction called D-Generation X. In order to be loved, tell everybody to suck your D. If you happen to be working at the Standards and Practices Department well, for the USA Network one? from 1997 to 2000, the mere mention of the letters DX will probably give you a PTSD flashback. Seemingly every week, Aww. DX would invent new ways to joke about their penises. They spent every moment on screen basically <laughs> acting as raunchy as possible. Oh they also popularized God. the crotch chop 10 years before Waluigi did it. One time, the members of DX rode a literal tank to the front door of WCW Nitro just to stick it to their competition. But if there's one thing Triple H and DX hated more than Ew. WCW, it's authority. Oh, hey, wait yeah. a minute. Anyway, whenever McMahon's hey, ruthless come on. corporation that was back would attack a defenseless wrestler, DX would seemingly always be there to level the playing field. And that's exactly what happened in Mankind's championship match versus The Rock. We enter a scene of utter chaos, as the audience anxiously Sounds waits like on the pins Usos and needles, anticipating moment. if mankind can do the unthinkable like the line, and you know? win the WWF title. And that's when they hear the all-too-familiar sound. At this moment, the roof of the arena is about to become unhinged, from the surprise return <gasps> of Stone Cold yes! Steve Austin. 
order to be loved. Finally, he mentions him. Be the shiz out of your boss. Stone yeah, Cold Steve he did Austin that. may be the most popular wrestler of all time, even more yeah, so is. than Hulk Hogan. But he, like many other wrestlers I've talked about here, came from humble beginnings. Stunning Steve Austin oh, was just an average hairs, and forgettable guys, wrestler in for day, WCW in the so mid-90s. Bad. In 1995, <laughs> WCW How unceremoniously fired Austin while he was out of action with an injury. But if things couldn't get bad enough for Steve, this was also the time when he went completely bald. And when this a man so has lost his him. hair, he has nothing left to lose. Oh, really? Steve Austin would join the WWF with a vengeance. Actually, he cultivated so the anger from his WCW firing and adopted it into a Stone Cold new persona. Stone Cold Steve Austin became a pissed off redneck from Texas who would beat up everyone and everything. He was the consummate anti-hero, constantly interrupting matches to beat people up for literally no reason. These antics made him popular for sure. But he would only attain legendary stardom through his feud with Vince McMahon. Yeah, this was the best. Everybody wanted to see this. Him destroying Those Vince. And Vince went with, with this, by the way. may have been confused earlier in this video when I mentioned that The Rock teamed up with Vince McMahon. Why is the owner of the WWF recruiting a stable of bad guys to beat up other wrestlers in his company? Well, unlike most billionaire CEOs, Vince McMahon is deeply passionate about the product he's selling. Yep. And he is willing to put his own ass in the ring and exactly. get beat up by his own employees he did that, as long as it's good respect. for business. Even past the ripe old age of 70, Vince is still occasionally willing to step in the ring and take a top rope frog splash from a 266 pound fat guy oh. back in the 90s when the WWF was in serious danger of going mm. under. Vince took it upon himself to do whatever was necessary to save his company, going yeah. so far as to abandon his casual role as a commentator and quickly transform himself into the most despicable villain in all of wrestling. You gotta Hello, do what Peter. you gotta do. What's happening? <laughs> so I was sitting in my cubicle today and I realized ever since I started working, um, every single day of my life has been worse than the day before it. Aww. So that means that every I hope you don't feel like that about that your you job, me, guys. Do what you love. That's on the worst day of my life. The 90s ushered in a period of sterile corporatization for the mm, American worker. I would not this was a time like when this. most Americans had fallen out of faith I with the couldn't. government, but still somewhat trusted their corporate overlords. A time before companies like Enron and the big banks royally screwed up and put the world economy on a downward spiral. Oh a time God. before the internet transformed the paradigm of what was thought possible for earning a paycheck. Most Americans entering the workforce at this time were left with one of one option. You would spend all your daylight hours, Monday through Friday, working in a cubicle under oppressive fluorescent lighting. And you were expected to do this week in and week out for 40 years. Oh, Naturally, geez. a lot of workers weren't exactly thrilled with this reality. Vince McMahon must have known this because starting in 1998, he transformed himself into the living embodiment of everything Americans hated about their corporate their boss, world. boss, yeah! And for every ounce of hatred projected on Vince, Americans found an equal amount of catharsis in watching Stone Cold Steve Austin repeatedly beat the piss out of him on national TV. The Austin McMahon feud escalated throughout the entire year, and it catapulted yeah. Austin into mainstream stardom. Steve Austin did on a weekly basis what every layperson in America wishes they could have done to their bosses, teachers, or any other oppressive authority <laughs> figure teachers. that separated them from what I they was wanted. A teacher. He I represents something universal about, about the human spirit the desire to fight back against those who control you, the constant dream of capturing your own slice of agency. Stone Cold yep. Steve Austin is a man who cannot be controlled because the second you try, he'll blow up your bus, fill your car with cement, ah! and spray you with beer from a fire hose. And most importantly, so <laughs> he'll give the people what they want. Yeah, hell yeah. Look how More high. <laughs> just left. 
Many wrestling historians like to point to this moment as the loudest crowd reaction in WWE history. Yeah, I know. I guess ultimately that's the whole point of all of this. To give people a window into a different (gasps) world. A world where you could truly believe the unbelievable. A world where valiant heroes could overcome seemingly impossible odds. And where despicable villains would always be brought to justice. Eventually. You just had to keep watching to see it happen. And many Americans did even if it was just for two hours a week on a Monday night. Wrestling historians also like to point to this event as the moment where WWF surpassed WCW once and for all as the premier wrestling company in America. Over on TNT, the Nitro commentators intentionally spoiled the ending of that night's Raw ahead of time. If you're even thinking about changing the channel to our competition, fans do not. is going to win their world title. This decision backfired spectacularly as 600,000 Nitro viewers immediately changed the channel to Raw to witness one of the greatest moments in professional wrestling history. She just gave them literally... those who kept watching Nitro that night got to witness one of the most anticlimactic and frustrating moments in wrestling history. As the despicable villain Hollywood Hogan reclaimed the WCW championship after his so-called opponent Kevin Nash literally laid down and gave it to him. Two years later, WCW would go out of business, and Vince would finally achieve his goal of conquering the last major American wrestling promotion he by did acquiring it himself, WCW by for way. pennies on the dollar. Right after the WCW commentators spoiled the end of Raw that night, Tony Schiavone infamously mocked the idea of mankind winning the WWF title by sarcastically commenting, oh, gonna put some butts in the seat. Technically, he was correct in his snide assessment, because no one was sitting down in the Centrum Center as the referee counted to three on mankind's first ever championship victory. Monday Night Raw is still on Crazy. the air today. WWE yep. and wrestling as a whole have largely diminished in popularity since this time. It's a decline brought about yeah. not from what's different in the ring, but rather how the world has changed around it. True. And for this reason, WWE may never again be able to replicate a moment of this spectacle, but nothing else on TV really could either. The pure hype of the crowd surrounding the ring that night is something truly unique about professional wrestling. There's a visceral, palpitating feeling of unbridled excitement that permeates through whatever screen you're watching it on, even 20 years later. The cascading wave of emotion on display here is, quite simply, raw. And you'd be hard-pressed to replicate something like this with any other TV show. Not bad for something that's not even real. This is the end of just another episode of Monday Night Raw. There are more than 1,300 other episodes like it and counting. So if you find yourself bored on a Monday night flipping through channels on TV, and you happen to catch a glimpse of a bunch of weird-looking muscle men brawling on the USA Network, <laughs> you can stop and appreciate it. Because there will never ever be another TV show like it. What a great video. I agree. I just hope we, I will experience in my life a moment like this myself. Great job. Good job. Really, an amazing video. I have never seen a video more entertaining than this one. He didn't even use so many like clips and mostly like pictures, but the way he said everything he said was so, so entertaining. I And so simplified as well. I really, really loved it. Let's see the comments, you guys. I have defeated the corporation. John Cena announcing the death of Osama Bin Laden to a live crowd is still one of the funniest, most American thing ever. Oh my God. Austin wrestling was one thing, but his ability to catch a beer from someone in the nosebleed section and then down it two seconds flat was pure talent. Ah, That's like the connection between the crowd, you know, between the audience and himself. Uh, fun fact, experienced plays weren't some high brow activity in their heyday. At the end of work days, Britons would cross the river over to the globe where there were hookers, dogfights, cockfights, bars, and all sorts of entertainment. Shakespeare plays would have a standing section where, yeah, actually, like the ground section, people who are poor could would, would, would be able to like watch the play and then the higher you go up the higher hierarchy of people would come and watch the plays and even like it was so dirty in front that whenever someone who is like 
a higher um from a higher statue would come they would always have to like put something so they can even walk across and get into that uh into the play or whatever it's called that that theater yeah the oldest british theater but that is it uh, mick foley was incredible talented don't take that away from him just because he gave his body and years of his life to wrestling more than any wrestlers before and after him to be honest like uh, this is the thing about wrestling they don't have to be like the guys who are wrestling they don't have to be like all looking like john cena the rock roman reign like you have people like kevin owens you have people like mick foley who don't really look like a wrestler but that's what gives them this a connection with the audience because they more resemble who we are as normal human beings and they defy that and they go and they still give you a great show which gives you the inspiration that you yourself could do something like that you could fight your own battles as well you don't have to be on the top of your game and looking the best or whatever, you know, like that is something that you cannot take away. And being a human being and being humble and being down to earth and letting people know that you are just one of them is, is really important. And people take that for granted. I personally get mostly connected with uh people who are like let's say content creators or youtubers who are who resemble me or who are more humble who i can like relate to you know than people who are like the kardashians or whatever like you know like it's it's a whole different thing uh but that is it guys for today's video i hope you enjoyed it thank you so much for watching if you did enjoy it make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more and if you want to share some extra love you can always go to the share button and copy the link there and you don't have to share it anywhere just copying the link will help with the algorithm but that is it thank you so much for watching have a wonderful evening and see you tomorrow with a brand new video bye Oh, I'll keep it